All right, so welcome back, and let's finish talking about the Ottoman, uh, the, excuse me, not the Ottoman, the Gunpowder Empires, um, and magically, I have managed to get rid of the floating bullet points, uh, in between the last slide here. Okay, so the Safavid Empire is further to the east than the Ottomans, and like I said, the Ottomans um, didn't get on well with their neighbors to the west very much. They were kind of fighty with Western Europe, and they were also kind of fighty with their neighbors to the east, and there were good reasons for that. So the first thing you have to understand is that the Safavid Empire, yes, is Muslim, but it's Shiite. They do not practice the same form of Islam as the Ottoman Empire or their neighbors even further to the east, the Mughals. These guys are different. So they had been founded by a group of uh, religious followers um, from Azerbaijan, which is a little bit north and east of modern day Iran. Um, it's a mountainous region. The people there are tribal um, largely. And uh, this group had become exposed to a branch of Shia Islam um, um, and they saw themselves, it, it's a form called Twelver Islam, um, and they they saw themselves as sort of religious purifiers. Um, they were kind of bringing about the true form of the faith. Um, and they saw this true form of the faith needed to be carried out through conquest. Um, so these tribal horsemen, they ride south and west and um, south and now south and east, um, down into Iran, and they conquer what was then Persia and is today Iran, and they establish the Safavid Empire. So the Safavids were not just like territorial rivals to the Ottomans, although they definitely fought over land and trade rights and that sort of stuff. They were also religious rivals. They did not necessarily celebrate the same sort of religious rituals that the, their Sunni neighbors did. Um, the Their Sunni neighbors in the Ottoman Empire actually eventually cut off um, their uh, their um, Hajj uh, routes, their routes for pilgrimage to Mecca, which meant that Shia Islam that developed in Persia um, became less, em it, it emphasized to a lesser degree the Hajj, um, because frankly, Muslims who lived in Persia couldn't make the Hajj because the Ottomans wouldn't let them into Mecca. Um, so this led to a lot of conflict. Um, they were also kind of squished in between not just the Ottomans and the Mughals, but also to the northeast, there was a very, very kind of um, uh, like ferocious rival group uh, in what is today Uzbekistan um, that was tribal and nomadic and constantly fighting into their territory. So out of just defensive necessity, the Safavids had to develop a very, very strong military. Um, their most important leaders, the first most uh, the first leader that is really critical for the Safavids um, is uh, Shah Ismail. Ismail was one of the tribal leaders out of Azerbaijan who conquers down into Persia and establishes the Safavid Empire. He takes the Persian title Shah, which means king. Um, as, as a way to legitimize his rule over Persia. He conquers Persia and then takes the title of king in the Persian language to show that he has the right to do so. So Shah Ismail is best known as a military leader. He didn't do a whole lot of governance, um, but he conquered a lot of territory. However, Shah Abbas the Great is probably the most important in terms of politics and culture. Um, he was also a great military strategist, um, and he kind of took a page out of the Ottoman Empire's book. Um, Shah Abbas really didn't have a choice. He lost actually quite a lot of territory to the Ottomans early on after having been crowned Shah. And he, he lost outright, partially because the Ottomans were using more modern weaponry, including um, cannons and muskets, um, and they also had the Janissaries. They had this professional fighting force that was trained to do nothing but fight in like very professional, like strategic ways. So Shah Abbas decides that he, if you can't beat him, you got to join him, right? So he reforms the Safavid military on the same level as the Janissaries. Um, 
Um, he takes Christians um, from the northwestern territories of the Safavid Empire and forces them into the um, into a system very similar to the Devshirme, um, and raises them separate from their families to kind of take away those local tribal loyalties and instead make them directly loyal to him, which makes them a more effective fighting force. He also reforms the government. He hires officials on the basis of their competence, their loyalty, rather than their family. Family or uh, family or tribal uh, association, but one of the most important things that Shah Abbas does is he realizes the importance of politics, um, and he is a really great politician. He's incredibly smart. So what he does is he knows that the Ottomans are at war with Europeans, particularly they're at war with the French. Don't ask; it's a thing. Um, and they're at war with the Spanish again. Don't ask; it's a thing. And they're at war with the Germans. That's the whole like trying to take over Vienna bit. Um, and so as a result, Shah Abbas writes a number of diplomatic letters to the French, to the Austrians, um, to the Spanish and to the British and basically is like, hey, I hear you got a problem with the Ottomans and you want access to spice trade and all sorts of stuff. Well, we have access to spices, and you know what? We don't like the Ottomans very much either. You're welcome to come around and hang out with us all you like. And that's what wound up happening. The Safavids develop a reputation for being civilized, for being diplomatic, at least with Europe, um, because they know how to play politics. And so as a result, some of their capital cities, like Isfahan and Qom, um, they have a really European flair to them. While they still incorporate an awful lot of Muslim architecture um, and some influence from e East Asia, um, they also have kind of a distinct like French flair to them as a result. So this is the territory that the Safavids eventually can, uh, had. Um, the area that's outlined in red was the territory that really represents most of the Safavid territory. This area over here was lost very early on by Shah Abbas um, to, to the Ottoman Empire. This is what convinced him that he was going to have to kind of put up or shut up and create his own version of the Janissaries. Um, over here, this is where you have the Uzbek tribes. Um, they were constantly fighting um, the uh, the Safavids, and so the Safavids really aren't very powerful because they can't really expand. They're sort of squished in between a number of major powers. But they are able to trade across the Caspian Sea, which they do. They trade with Russia and across the Persian Gulf, and they do that as well. Now, this right here is a really good example of Safavid art and artistry. Um, they are known for the fineness of their detail, for um, their tile work, um, for the blue glaze that they used in their tiles. This is a mosque in the city of Isfahan, um, which is in kind of south central Iran. Um, it is still there, obviously, today. Um, it is on my bucket list of places I desperately want to go. I mean, look how how beautiful that is. Um, and this is this is the thing about Safavid art, is it's all about detail and fineness. It's not about scale. Their buildings aren't large, they're just incredibly beautiful. Um, so yeah, that's kind of Safavid art for you. Now let's move one bit further to the east and let's talk about the Mughals, because they are my favorite. So the Mughals are pretty cool. The Mughals initially um, are kind of a, a secondary Muslim empire that develops in India. If you remember, we talked about Islam spread into India around the 12th century in the 1100s, and it spread through Turkic Muslim forces who were nomadic, who traveled across the Indus River and settled in the Indo-Gigantic Plain um, up by the Ganges River. And they established a series of small kingdoms that kind of worked together as a confederation Federation, and this became known as the Delhi Sultanate. But it wasn't very powerful, and it didn't rule a lot of people. And so the Delhi Sultanate was kind of more of an idea than something that was really effective. But starting in the 16th century, that changes. 
Over in Afghanistan, which is a little bit further to the west of uh, what is today Pakistan, there was a uh, Central Asian king by the name of Babur, and he was a direct descendant of both uh, Tamerlane, who was another Mongol leader, and Genghis Khan. He's a direct uh, descendant on his mother's side of Genghis Khan. Um, and he was, he basically saw India as his potential territory. Like he grew up with the idea that he was going to conquer India. So in 1525, he swept across the north of India and he establishes the Mughal Empire. Now, Babur is Muslim, he is Sunni, and India, of course, is mostly Hindu. And the population of India is so large that Babur is not going to be able to force people to convert to Islam. That is just not going to happen. But he establishes his dominance through military supremacy. Um, when he swept into India in 1525, it was the first time people in that region had ever seen a cannon. And so it scared the like the crud out of everybody um, on the battlefield. And this was how he established his rule. But his the most important leader of the Mughal Empire, the most fascinating guy out there, is a guy by the name of Abu Akbar, um, also called Akbar the Great. Okay, so Abu Akbar is really cool. He is Babur's grandson. Um, Akbar's father ruled for like a minute and a half and died young, and Akbar inherited the throne when he was 13. So... Akbar conquers further south, not just the northern portion of India, he conquers almost the entirety of the Indian subcontinent, except for the very, very tip down there at the south. But the thing that is coolest about Abu Akbar is that he was remarkably religiously tolerant. He decided that given the fact that there was only about 20% of the population that was Muslim and about 80% of the population that was Hindu, that it would be extremely dumb to try and force people to convert or to punish people who weren't Muslim. And so he eliminated the tax that usually existed in Muslim empires on non-Muslims. Um, in the Safavid Empire, basically, if you weren't Shiite, you couldn't get a job at all. Like, it was really not tolerant at all in the Safavid Empire. But in the Mughal Empire, Akbar actually hired Buddhist and Hindu, Catholic, Jewish, Jain, Sikh, and Shiite advisors. He actually had a Jesuit Catholic priest um, act as a tutor to his second oldest son. Um, he had many wives, which was not uncommon for men of his station. Um, but he was also really tolerant of the religion practiced within his own family. Um, he married many Hindu women. Um, his favorite wife in particular was Hindu. And he even allowed her to have temples built within the palace um, of a Muslim emperor um, to worship as she saw fit. So he was remarkably religiously tolerant, which is pretty cool. But the other thing that I really like about Akbar is he had a really good understanding of taxation. Now, this sounds very boring, but what he did was he used a system called a graduated tax rate. And what that means is that he essentially used a formula to determine what a person's income was. And therefore, based on their level of poverty, what their level of taxation should be. It's not a flat tax. And it was something that basically meant that richer people paid more in taxes and poor people didn't have to pay as much because taxes penalize poor populations. And so this was way more fair to the po poor populations. And so to be poor under Akbar was actually, I mean, it wasn't good, you were still poor, but you were unlikely to starve to death, which was pretty awesome. So. Akbar conquered, this territory was what his uh, grandfather Babur initially established and then conquered into this purple area. Akbar conquered down and included all of this uh, sort of uh, um, orangey color area. And then this territory is going to be added in later. Okay, so... I may have to go into another video shortly, so I'm going to do that. It will take me a grand total of like two, three minutes to finish this up, I promise. So I'm going to go ahead and stop this video.